officer reported to me that one of his colleagues, Dr. Franklin Lamb, shot in Tripoli by uh, NATO Al-Qaeda uh, peace activist. Um, Webster Tarpley, tell us more about the peace that's reportedly killed thousands in the last 24 hours. Well, what we're dealing with here is a carefully, cynically planned military operation by the NATO High Command, with the U.S. playing a very, very important role in it. Don't listen to anything to the contrary. It is called Operation Mermaid Dawn, and in the middle of that, you've also got something called Operation Mermaid or Operation Siren. Similar terms uh, coming maybe from the French, but uh, this is a military operation, and it's basically this. They're facing the mid-September deadline when the United Nations Security Council resolution runs out. And without that resolution, it's very hard for Italy and Canada and a bunch of smaller NATO countries to play a role. And since the main bases have to be in Italy because of the geography, there's a hysterical uh, attempt in, in NATO to put an end to this. Now, what they've done is, first of all, Carpet bombing uh, instead of um, certain... uh, 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 thought crime, love bombing. Yeah, right. Carpet bombing, carpet bombing of civilians. No concern for civilian casualties. Just a mad dash to get it all over with. So, uh, very, very heavy bombing of Tripoli and of the uh, approaches to Tripoli in the past uh, week or so. And in addition, a very aggressive use of these Apache helicopters with. Uh, a lot of strafing of civilians with machine guns, especially in some rockets. And this, this is accounted for something up, upwards of 1,300 dead civilians uh, in the past uh, 48 hours, let's say. Uh, 1,300 dead as of yesterday and then many more overnight. So this is, uh, this is the protection of civilians under the U.N. Security Council resolution. So carpet bombing Apache helicopters, that accounts for the rapid progress of the rebels. Now, the other thing that accounts for it is amphibious landings. All reports now agree that smaller landing craft as well as larger NATO warships cruised up very close to the coast there, to the port of Tripoli on the Mediterranean, and landed these death squads, these terror teams of Al Qaeda killers who had been shipped in from Benghazi and Tobruk and, and Derna and places like this. So. This, I think Webster's, let me, look, we're pro-America here on this show, so don't, don't criticize the valiant Al-Qaeda forces. Right. Uh, by, by the way, they're, they're banning first responders from the 9-11 uh, remembrance event. So the 9-11 responders are bad, Al-Qaeda's good. I'm going to have to have you apologize for talking bad about Al-Qaeda, or we're going to have to let you go. Okay, so uh, the, the, this, I think, accounts for this. It's, uh, it's, a, it's what you call in warfare a coup de main. In other words, they, they've, they've taken some key parts of the of the city. However, the reports I'm getting, and these come from Franklin Lamb that you mentioned, wounded though he is, he continues to report, Lizzie Phelan, who has been in the Rixos Hotel, and Darius Mahdi Nazem Rawaya. You can see a lot of this on uh, Russia Today. They continued to report during the night, and uh, especially Franklin Lamb is up in a, in a uh, high-rise hotel, and he can see the approaches coming into Tripoli from the, from the west. So, uh, what we've got is reports of a counterattack being organized by the Gaddafi forces, starting from the Gaddafi compound, with heavy fighting going on there, tanks under Gaddafi uh, and his supporters moving towards Green Square. We're even told that the rebels have lost control, at least temporarily, did lose control of Green Square when a, a column of Gaddafi forces uh, went through there. Uh, the counterattack seems to be under the command of Kamis Gaddafi, K-H-A-M-I-S. That's the one son who has not been captured. Three other sons captured, one son killed uh, months ago. The other thing we have is from Franklin Lamb and his vantage point in this uh, high-rise hotel. He says that he saw a, a convoy of 25 pro-Gaddafi military trucks going towards the center of the city. So... This, uh, I don't think, is over, um, and there are some indications that there was actually a strategy. I, I would say the Gaddafi forces were taken by surprise by the amphibious landings. This maybe accounts for why they didn't use their anti-ship missiles, which they are known to have. By the way, my sources say U.S., NATO, and private contractors were inserted 
two days ago from the sea. It's probably not just the valiant Al Qaeda people. Yes. Well, the report that I have, if you if you look uh, look at topme.net, I've got the, uh, the the report is that from Maison that the Al Qaeda fighters from Benghazi that were landed by NATO were under the control of NATO officers, so European officers, which reproduces the eternal pattern of the colonial army, just what the Libyans had thought that they'd they'd gotten rid of. So uh, heavy fighting, I think, goes on. Uh, there is a humanitarian emergency. In particular, I would mention that the, the people in this Rixos Hotel, the international reporters, these are international reporters who are basically anti-NATO. They don't agree with the CIA line. And that would, that would be Makhdi Darius Nazem Rawaya that you can see on Russia today. Franklin Lamb is in a different hotel. And uh, Thierry Maison is also still in the city. I would also point out there seems to be... Uh, Danger to the life of Musa Ibrahim, who is the spokesperson of the regime, as well as his wife and his son. The rebels are telling people on, on YouTube that they're going to exact a terrible fate. Now you can Well, that's the peace, too, though. Killing women and children, you know, that's, that's what the good guys do. Right. You're not so, going to criticize torture on this show, are you? Uh, we could, we, I think we can, um, we can simply, you know, if you want to start, t take a case study of the human rights record of these uh, Benghazi rebels. See what happens to Musa Ibrahim and his family. That will tell you uh, everything. Uh, now, in terms of what's going to happen now, uh, Gaddafi, if Gaddafi can, can maintain some kind of a, of a position in the, in the capital or nearby, that's, that's a very different scenario from what the television is telling you. If Gaddafi is decisively defeated in the Tripoli area, he would probably be well advised to, to take the example of Mubarak and uh, go to some friendly place and perhaps uh, lay low for a while and wait for the inevitable civil war among these thieves, because these are thieves who are going to fall out. You can already see... Well, they've been constantly killing each other and calling in airstrikes on each other. That's admitted. Exactly. So that would be this Khalifa Hifter. The top CIA guy is Khalifa Hifter. But, of course, he lived in Virginia. He lived here by between the Pentagon and the CIA for 20 years. And there are going to be factional differences between him and, say, a bunch of guys like uh, uh, the ones who, who in Dharna who had been fighting the U.S. in Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't see how they're going to get along very well. You've also got Jalil, who is the, the presentable face, and Jabril. Uh, these people have uh, really no mass support. They're there to have a presentable face that they can send to the United Nations uh, and, and so forth. So I would expect a bloody civil war to break out among the rebel factions uh, quite soon. And especially, we've got this 70-page report of what the occupation is going to look like. The, uh, the occupation calls for tens of thousands of troops from the United Arab Emirates, Emiratis. Now, those guys are royalists. They're reactionaries in all of their social policies, whereas Gaddafi is one of the most progressive, uh, socially oriented people, right? All the oil money was used, or to a large extent, for, uh, for health care. For, yeah, for so they're going to send in foreigners to help make sure all the money is stolen. And to enforce uh, privatization, deregulation, the race to the bottom, the usual IMF shock therapy agenda. But if, if, if the foreign troops come in, even if they're so-called Arabs from the United Arab Emirates, or even worse, Qatar, the, the, uh, the people there in Doha, that will lead to a civil war, I think, in short order. So my, my advice well, is... stay there. Stay it's a basically absolute humanitarian disaster in the name of stopping one. Webster Griffin Tarpley is our guest. I've seen three polls out this weekend where Ron Paul is number one. Uh, the Drudge Report at DrudgeReport.com, we're also posting this at Infowars.com, uh, has the headline that Ron Paul is evenly matched against Obama. Uh, he's neck and neck with Obama. There it is, Gallup. Obama closely matched against Paul and Bachman. So as I keep telling you, because I'm, I'm not just cheerleading here and saying Ron Paul can win. <clears throat> you know, three and a half years ago, I was just pointing out he's an underdog, but he should win. Now, if you look at all the hundreds of polls I've seen, different straw polls, he's number one, number two, or number three. Now, that is a front runner. That's with them ignoring him or demonizing him. So they're, they're definitely scared of Ron Paul. Uh, now, shifting gears back to Webster Griffin Tarpley of Tarpley.net, 
uh, Webster, any way you slice it, I'm not a fan of Gaddafi. But compared to Al-Qaeda, there is such a thing as lesser of two evils. And he, and he wasn't a total pig. I mean, he, he did build up the country and the rest of Africa. So, and, and we know it means civil war, death, destruction uh, of a, a comparative jewel uh, in the region. And uh, this is the same reason they took down Serbia. Again, not a fan of Milošević or any of those guys, but... Um, at the end of the day, why did NATO do this? Well, on the one hand, Gaddafi represents an ideological threat because of this uh, an Arab socialism, which he actually practiced. Uh, Libya probably has the best record of any oil-producing country in terms of reinvesting that in social development. They, they, this was the top country on the United Nations Human Development Index for Africa, and uh, they were at 57 in the world, which meant that they were beating Russia, beating Ukraine, beating Brazil, and it's remarkable because they had started so near rock bottom. They were absolute, uh, basically nomads until about 1965, 1970, when, when Gaddafi came in. Remember, you've got that great man-made river, which means that they're going to have water for the next couple of hundred years, uh, unless NATO has bombed it in the meantime. Uh, and that, uh, you know, health care was for free, housing allowances were given. These are the things that NATO hates. So they want to go in there now and privatize all that. And they had been, uh, the weakening of Gaddafi is due to the fact that there was a first privatization offensive in 2003 when they demanded the partial privatization of certain of the oil. And because he was, he was under the gun of what Bush had just done in Iraq, he felt that he had to make concessions. And unfortunately, that even reached up into his into his family. And now it's admitted that the 70 plus billion in banks is being stolen, the tens of billions in gold is now going to disappear uh, and, and stolen from the people of Libya. I mean, this is just so outrageous. Right. Uh, the, the, the frozen assets that the State Department has got custody of now, uh, the U.S. part, I don't know how many billion there are, but there are, there are quite a few billion. Uh, that's going to go into the Swiss bank accounts of these uh, face men uh, like Jalil, Jabril, uh, Hifter, the people who are running that Benghazi rebel council, and none of that will ever be seen as humanitarian aid. This is going to be a kleptocracy beyond your wildest dreams. Well, that's dreams. my next issue. Are they going to use Libya as their new al-Qaeda base to then menace the West? Yeah, you can imagine al-Qaeda piracy in the Mediterranean. You know, it's funny, uh, and if you go back to American history, uh, in the early 1800s... The Thomas big, Jefferson. The big concern was uh, the, the Barbary pirates, right? Stephen Decatur and all this. So it meant that these, these, these ports in North Africa were uh, the bases of, uh, of pirates. And the, the pirates, of course, worked with the British because the British bought protection. Others couldn't. The U.S. couldn't and didn't and therefore had to wage these wars. Today you've got the U.S. intervening in a place like Libya to reestablish piracy, but this time under al-Qaeda auspices. So this is going to have a big effect on the entire Mediterranean littoral, from Spain to Italy to Greece, all the way across. This is now going to fundamentally change what the Mediterranean looks like. Uh, and again, it's, it's going to be an open sore. If, if you didn't want al-Qaeda to have a sanctuary, if that was the point of Afghanistan, they have just been given a, a sanctuary, or at least it seems All right, so. Webster, stay there. Let's, the do five, Europe. let's do five more minutes in prisonplanet.tv overdrive. The, the official radio show is over. See you back tomorrow, 11 a.m. Spread the word about the broadcast. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds?